Matthew chapter 25, beginning in verse 14. When you have it, say faith. faith. So I want to build up today. It says, for the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. And to one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, and to each according to his own ability. That's important. Underline that. To each according to his own ability. And then immediately he went on a journey. Verse 16. Then he who had received the five talents went and traded with them and made another five talents. And likewise, he who had received two gained two more. But look at verse 18 here. Look at this. It says, but he who had received one went and dug in the ground and he hid his Lord's money. And then after a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled account with them. Praise God. God, before you're seated, shake your neighbor's hand and say, I'm glad I sat next to you. <clears throat> you may be seated today. What a great crowd this morning. The word that God has given uh, to me for you this first part of the year has been the word faith. I just kind of feel like if we're going to step into the next dimension as a people, how many know that God wants us to grow our faith? You know, God gives us a measure of faith, but he leaves it up to us to grow our faith. Look over at your neighbor and tell him, you have to grow your faith. And, and, and I want to share this with you. Often we don't grow because we're not being taught how the kingdom of God works when it comes to faith. You say, Pastor, why, why do some people not grow in their faith? Well, I'll tell you, it's because we're not being taught the principles of the kingdom of God. And I feel like this message is just so critical for you, so critical for us, primarily because many of us are at a very important time of our life, a very critical time of our life. Many of us who are even in this room are you, what you would call the prime of your life. And I've got some good news and I've got some bad news for you. How many want the good news first? The good news is you look good. <laughs> there comes the bad news. You're never going to look as good as you do today. Can I hear an amen? <laughs> Tell your neighbor you look good. You got something. You're an important time in your life. You look better than you're ever going to look. You're stronger than you're ever going to be. You got more going on in your life. And that's why it's so important right now that you understand that the potential that God has placed inside of your hand. You have potential. And the kingdom of God has been given to you by him. But in order to experience the fullness of the kingdom, friends, I want to tell you this morning, faith is not about what you have, but faith is about what you do with what you have. Now, we know that we've got to do something with it. Someone say, do something with it. Because we know that we have an enemy. And we know that the assignment of the enemy is to steal our faith. You know the scripture in John. He says the enemy comes what? To steal, to kill, and to destroy. So we know that the enemy is on an assignment to steal our faith. Now you might ask this question, well, Pastor, how does the enemy steal my faith? I'll tell you how he does it. He convinces you that you don't have to use what God has given you. He knows God's given you something. He, know God, he knows that God has deposited something inside of you. So what the enemy does is he tries to convince you and I that we could just sit on what God has given us. See, the reason the enemy comes that way, and, and I hope you're learning something so far. I feel like I'm teaching already. But the reason the enemy comes that way is because the enemy knows the kingdom of God and how it works very well. In fact, the enemy knows more about the kingdom of God than some Christians. And the enemy knows this, that if that he knows God has given you an ability, he knows that God has given you something. So the enemy knows that if he can get you to sit on what God has given you or to get you and keep you from planting what God has given you, he can keep God from multiplying it. The enemy's entire plan is to stop God from multiplying, to stop the kingdom of God from multiplying. So he attacks us to try to convince us to sit on what God has given us. Am I preaching all right? 
So faith, watch this, is not possessing something. Faith is taking what we have and putting it into action for the glory of God. It's taking what we have and putting it into action. Look, not for our advancement, but for God's advancement, for the kingdom's advancement. Are you with me so far today? I don't want to preach very long, but I do want to share with you some principles about growing faith right out of this scripture. If you have a pen, I want you to follow along with me. The first thing I want to share with you, the first principle that we find in the story we read is that what we have doesn't belong to us. All right. I want you to get that inside of your spirit. What we have doesn't belong to us. In fact, what we have simply we have been entrusted with it. What we have, we've been entrusted with it. We have been given it by God. And we're simply stewards of what God has given us. We're simply stewards of the kingdom of God. Let me put it this way. We are simply stewards of our own life. Now, in the in the dictionary, you might ask, what is a steward? Well, according to Webster's, a steward is a person employed to manage another person's property, especially a large house or a state. So a steward is simply someone who's been assigned to manage what God has given them. And Paul writes to the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2. He says, moreover, it is required in a steward that one be found faithful. So we can stop there for a moment and ask ourselves, have we been faithful with what God has given us? You're not saying nothing to me. Have we been faithful with the gifts that God has given us? Have we been faithful with what God has placed in our hand? Have we been faithful in our marriage? Have we been faithful with our children? Have we been faithful stewards over the kingdom of God within our life? In, in those days, it was not uncommon for wealthy businessmen of that time to go on long journeys. And when they would go on these journeys, they wouldn't have car, no plane, you know, no bike. They'd go by donkey, go by camel, go by foot. So you know it took a long time. So when they would leave, they would entrust their goods to a trusted servant or a trusted slave. Now these businessmen, they did not leave their goods only to be protected. Watch this. They didn't leave their goods with that servant and that slave only to be protected what God has given you he doesn't just give it to you so you could protect it he didn't give them those goods just for protection but he also gave it to them for the purpose of production that while he was on his journey watch this he left them entrusted with the goods and their job wasn't just to protect the goods but their job was to also be productive with the good goods that when he came back from his long journey and he returned to from his journey what did he expect from them he expected growth he expected expansion he expected Prophet. See, you and I must recognize that God expects for us to take what he has entrusted us with and not just protect it, but he wants us to invest it. He wants us to grow it. He wants us to multiply it. He wants to make it better. He wants us to take it to another level. Somebody say amen. See, God is an investor. God is an investor, and that's something we need to understand about the Lord. How many of you want to grow your faith? I may want to go to another level this year. Then, then you've got to recognize that God is an investor. Tell your neighbor, he's an investor. You say, well, pastor, how does this pertain to me? I'll tell you how it pertains to you. We must recognize that our life is not our own. You say, what is that? What are you talking about? I came to tell you whether you've been coming to church for 20 years or for 20 days, your life is not your own. Your life is not your own. And here's what I want to share with you about that, is that when you view life as your own, when you look at your life as my life, your own life, let me tell you, there is nothing moving you in a spirit of accountability toward productiveness. You're able to move at your own pace. When you look at life as your own, you don't answer to anybody. You don't give an account to anybody. If you feel like working that day, you work. If you don't feel like working, you don't work. If you feel like going to church, you go to church. If you feel like serving God or not, you do whatever you want because you look at life as your own. I was talking to a young lady this week 
And she says to me, she says, I don't have to answer to anybody. My life is my own. I don't have to answer to anybody. That's somebody that views life as their own. But when you recognize that our life is not our own, but our life has been given to us by God. God, come on, somebody. We have a desire to do something with our life. We have a desire to be great, not for our glory. Come on, somebody. We have a desire to be great unto the glory of God because we know that the Lord is coming back real soon. And when the Lord comes back, he's going to say to us, have you not only protected it, but have you been productive with it? I'm going to talk to you a little bit more because I believe that there's some of us here that have got to get out of that mentality that it's your life, that it's your way of doing things. You have an earthly view, but you need to have a heavenly view and recognize that somebody is watching you. Somebody is keeping you to an account and it's our heavenly father that says, I'm the one that gave you the talent. I'm the one that gave you the ability. I'm the one that gave you that boyfriend. I'm the one that gave you that husband I'm the what we have doesn't belong to us somebody say amen Amen. and he's looking for a people come on somebody that will do it for his glory do we got a people like that here in the house today so let me tell you about the second thing are you with me so far second thing we learn here about faith it's not only do, does what we have not belong to us, but secondly, we have what we can handle. We have what we can handle. And, and, and here's the good news is that nobody here is empty-handed. Nobody here is empty-handed. Nobody here is without. Nobody here has nothing given to them, for, regardless of how you feel. You know, you got people in the service, oh, I don't have nothing. No, it's not true. You got something. Wow. Touch your neighbor tell them, you got something. God has given you something. Some of you, God just gave a bad attitude, but at least you got something. (laughs) It's something. Come on, somebody. You know, God doesn't leave us without something to work with. He always gives us something to work with. We're not empty handed. And when we find what Jesus, the master said, he said, you've been given it. According to your ability. What you have, you have based on your ability. And here's what I've learned. Is that God will always strengthen us in proportion to what he has given us. Now, I wish that I was one of those guys when I got saved that I had all the gifts. I remember when I was saved... I was jealous of guys that had all, I would look at guys like Marky, not to put Marky on blast this morning, I love Pastor Marky, but this guy has all the gifts, it makes me sick, it just bothers me, he's good looking, he can sing, he can preach, he can probably dance, I mean, who knows, this guy done anything, I don't know, Bree will tell you, he's got charm, dresses well, I came into the house of God weird, talk to me somebody, I didn't have five gifts. I was lucky to find the one that God gave me. Come on now, I was weird. I couldn't talk to people. I had an awkward mentality, awkward personality. I didn't know how to act in groups. Come on, somebody. Gave me the mic, said the wrong thing, still said the wrong, still say the wrong thing to this day if you're in the last service. All messed up. Talk to me. God gave me one gift. And you might look at me and say, no, that's not true, Pastor. Look how gifted you are. Let me tell you something. I didn't start out like this. But I had to take the one talent that God gave me, and I had to work that talent and be faithful over that talent and show the Lord some fruit coming out of that talent. And then when I was faithful, God gave me something else. He enlarged me a little bit more. And then I was faithful over two talents. Then he gave me three talents. Come on, somebody. And then I was faithful over three. Then he gave me four. Come on, somebody. And I'm here today because I learned to work with what God gave me. And I came to tell you this morning, you're not empty-handed. You just need to work with what God gave 
touch it every time. You got to work it, brother. You have what you can handle right now. Ooh, I'm going to say it again. You have what you can handle right now. Stop worrying about what I got and worry about what you got. Stop worrying about what your neighbor has. And start worrying about what you, Don't worry what kind of car they drive. You just be grateful over the car that God has given you. And you work that thing, baby. And you be faithful over with the talent and the ability. Say amen. See, there's two attitudes that kill a spirit of faith. Can I go there? How many know your attitude determines your altitude? And there are two attitudes that kill the spirit of faith. Number one, the attitude of complaining. A complaining spirit. Who, who just, I'm a preacher, sister. I'm doing what I can. Uh, who, who knows a complainer? Who, who knows a complainer? Always complaining, complaining, complaining on Facebook, complaining, complaining. Talk to me, somebody. And they say, oh, well, if I only had more. If I only had more, if I, if, if I only had more, I could do more. If I only had more money, I could do more with the money. If I only had a wife that cooperated with me. Come on, somebody. <laughs> or a husband that cooperated. If I only had more. Always complaining. If I had more, I could do more. Here's my answer to those that think that having more, they would do more. You don't know because the question is, what are you doing with what you have now? Because I've seen Christians buckle under more. I've seen Christians fail when God gave them more. And somehow more came into their life. Because they, weren't, they didn't know what it was to work with what they had. And what God is looking for in Victor Outreach San Diego is a group of people that will not only work what they have, but they'll be grateful over what they have. And as you're grateful and you begin... Uh, you, oh. I'll say, oh, well, if God gave me another husband, I'd be happier. How do you know? You can't even be happy with the husband you chose right now. Is this too strong for you this morning? I'm trying to get you to another level. I'm trying to see the blessing of God in your life. And you've got to take what God has given you, stop complaining about it, and start working. It's very to complain, man. Also, another spirit is, that kills faith is not only a spirit of complaint, but a spirit of stress. Whew, man, stress will mess you up. Have you ever heard someone say, I'm so stressed out? I'm so stressed out. They're trying to do something that they're not supposed to be doing. I'm so stressed out, I, I can't handle what I'm dealing with. They say things like, I can't do it all. And my wife knows I've been guilty of saying that. Woman, I can't do it all. <laughs> Sister Roberta Miller, I can't do it all. Chris, I can't do it all. I've been guilty of saying these things. But I think many times when we say those things is because we're trying to do it in our own strength. And, and a spirit of stress will stop you from working your talent because you're trying to do it in your own strength. Here's the good news, friends, is that we're not alone. God says, I know what I've given you. And I want to say something to some of you in this whole lesson. The Holy Spirit teaches us is that we're not as strong as we think we are. But we're also not as weak as we think we are. Some people walk around so strong. You think you're so strong. You think you're so strong. I can't tell you, you're not as strong as you think you are. You're not, you're not as strong as you portray yourself to be. We know it. But let me also say to those of you that are weak, you're not as weak as you think you are either. And sometimes we can't work with, we think we can't work with what God has given us and we can't make an impact with what God has given us. But I came to tell you something, my friend. You have something that the world doesn't have. You have the power of the Holy Spirit. You have the paracletus. You have the encourager. You have the great teacher. You have the indwelling of the fruit of the spirit. You have patience, love, joy, peace, long-suffering. Come on, somebody. You have the anointing of God that breaks the yokes of bondage. I came to tell you, church, you're not alone. God is with you. He's inside of you. He walks beside you. He's above you. He's beneath you. He's behind you, and he won't let you sink if you trust him. There have been many times in the past where I've worked out 
in the past. <laughs> I've been to the gym in the past. Not in that season, this moment. I'm going back though, one day. <laughs> and I'll be working out, lifting my weights, and then one of these guys, they'll get ready to lift. We want to go to another level. And they'll lean over to me and they'll say, hey, can you come spot me? And I don't want to see a brother die right in front of my eyes. <laughs> so I won't hesitate. I'll drop. I'll say, no problem, man. I'll come. And as he's lifting those weights, man, I, I won't just help him. But I'll encourage Come on, you got one more. Come on, you can do it. You got it inside of you. You're almost there. Come on. And then when he starts struggling on that last rep, I just kind of tap it. Come on. Just tap it. And I want to let you know that's the Holy Spirit in your life. He's there to spot you. You're trying to work what God has given you. You're trying to be faithful over what God has given you. But you got the Holy Ghost. And he's there to encourage you. He's there to say everything's going to be all right. Don't worry. I got your back. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. I've given you the power. I've given you the authority. Come on, somebody. I'm the one that gave you the talent. Come on, give him praise if you're grateful for it. So we have what we can handle. Terry neighbor, you got what you can handle. But let me show you where faith comes in and how you can take what you have and begin to expand it. The third thing we learn here about faith is that we must invest what we have. Write that down. In the story, we learn that having it is not enough. Having it is not enough. You know, you got a talent to sing. It's not enough. You've got a, a, a preaching ability. It's not enough. You have finances in the bank. It's not enough. You've got things going on in your life for the good. It's not enough. Someone say it's not enough. <laughs> you, you've got to be willing to take what the Lord has given you. And you've got to be willing to invest it into the kingdom of God. You got to invest. See, when you and I invest what we've been given, that's when God can multiply it. And I want to share this important truth with you about the kingdom of God. How many want to grow? God cannot. In fact, let me say God will not multiply what you hold back. I see people struggling. I see some of you struggling at times. I, you know, you carry it on you. There's a spirit of struggle in your life. You could see it. It's on you. And all I really see is not someone who's struggling. I see someone that's holding back from God. Holding back from giving to God what God has given to you. Holding back someone that's willing to take that gift and plant it. Are you with me? Holding back someone that's willing to take those finances and plant them in the kingdom. Holding back something the Lord has given you. You say, I've been hurt. We've all been hurt, but we just determined that we're not going to hold back any longer. We're going to plant what God's given us. We're going to we're going to be faithful. Come on, somebody over what the Lord has given us, because we want to multiply. How many of you want to multiply? See, God cannot multiply what we withhold. This is the system God has chosen. I, I don't understand why God chose the system, but this is the system. Do you accept that? How many of you accept it? Yeah. Right? Because you may not understand it. I don't even get it. I don't get it. I don't know how tithes and offering work. I don't know how this whole multiplication thing works. I don't either. All I know is that it works yeah. when you work it. Can I hear an amen? Yeah. And it's God's system. Someone say God's system. Yeah. See, farmers, Jesus used farmers a lot. Paul used farmers, talked about farming. Because farmers understood the system. They understood the principle. Now, if the, if the law said this, if the law or the principle said, I would receive exactly what I invested, then farmers probably would not have been involved in that. Because a farmer knows that when you only receive back what you invest, that's not a lucrative practice. If you just receive back what you invest, it's not enough not only to feed yourself, but you can't feed your family. And you wouldn't be able to take care of needs beyond that. How many can say amen? amen? But this is what farmers understand to be true. And this is what we need to understand to be true, is that whatever I plant, whatever I invest, God will multiply it. 
whatever I plant, whatever I invest, God will multiply it. Someone say multiply. How many of you want to multiply? Then if you want to multiply, you, you've got to take what you have and you have to be willing to invest it in something. I have a little prop for you today. Pastor Aldo, thank you very much. My lovely model, Pastor Aldo, thank you very much. <laughs> and how many know what this is? All right, this, is, this is an ear of corn. And this is what you get when you want to make some tamales. Come on, somebody. Mexicans can make food out of anything. But this is the ear of corn. And farmers understand that you must plant in order to have multiplication. And in this ear of corn, it is said that one seed of corn produces an entire ear. But if I open up this corn, which I'm going to do for you right now, and I hope I do it right. Tamales. <laughs> There's a lot of green stuff here. Open up this corn. I'm going to... I asked them to take some of it off, but it, clearly they didn't take it all off. Oh, there we go. I peel all this off. I have peel all this off. I have a lot of hair on here. What's going on? That's a hairy old corn. But I peeled it down. And now I understand that if I plant one seed of corn, I get a whole ear. But you know how many seeds of, cor of, of corn are on this ear? There are over 250 more seeds of corn on this ear. So in other words, when you plant one seed, God gives you 250 more. Come on and thank the Lord for that. Because we serve a God that is able to multiply whatever you entrust him back with. See, what I'm trying to get you to understand is that God has given you something. Say, God has given me something. He's given you a talent. He's given you an ability. He's given you a family. He's given you a skill. He's given you strong muscles. He's given you a brain. He's given you finances. He's given you something. As God is looking for somebody at Victory Outreach San Diego that they're willing to take what the Lord has given them and they're willing to plant it so that God says, I can multiply it so that my kingdom can be built. I've got corn now. I've got a whole ear of corn. And I've I got to make a choice now. Just like some of you, you've planted and God has given you a harvest. How many can say amen? But now you've got to make a choice. Someone say a choice. And there are three decisions I, I, I need to make. Decision number one is this. I can sell this corn and make a profit. I could take this corn. This is a good looking corn. It's got a little hair on it, but it's good looking. <laughs> and I know Alex is a businessman, so I said, Alex, you want to buy a piece of corn? He said, you know what, brother? I'll take that corn right now. Well, here you go, brother. Give me $25 for this corn. That's an expensive corn. I don't know what corn costs, but in my kingdom, it's $25. Amen, so amen. <laughs> and he'll buy it from me, and I'll have $25. But then if I want another corn, well, this is good. And I want another corn. I have to go back to Alex and buy another corn from him. So I went from being his boss to him being my boss. Mm, you'll catch that on your way to Denny's. Someone say, make a choice. I could sell what I have for a profit. How many know it's okay to do that? It's okay for me to sell this corn to Alex and to get 25 bucks. But if I want another corn, then I'm going to have to go back to him. The second choice I can make with my corn, now I got a nice little fat piece of corn. <laughs> Secondly, I could take a little mayonnaise. <laughs> Come on. Take a little mayonnaise, a little butter. Not margarine, you gotta get butter. Some butter. Come on, somebody. Some cheese, that Mexican cheese. Talk to me, I'm, you're getting hungry up in here. Little tapatio, come on, somebody. Put a little stick in it, or I just keep it like that. 
make me a little elote. And I don't even have to sell the corn. I can eat the corn. And the corn will satisfy me and make me feel good for 15 minutes. Come on, somebody. And I can enjoy that corn and I can, I can. But once that corn is gone, it's gone. Just like many people who come to the house of the Lord and God has placed seed in their hand and you don't plant it, but you'll give it to the fast food restaurants and you'll give it to rallies and to the taco shop and you'll give it to the gas station and you'll give it and you'll give it and it'll meet your need for the time and there's nothing wrong with it, but I'm trying to take your life to a whole nother level. I'm trying to move you from being a borrower to being a lender. I'm trying to take you from being an employee to being a boss. Somebody shout. Somebody get behind this word. You got a third choice. That's a third choice. I could sell it and make some money. That's good. I can eat it and make an elote and that tastes good. I gain weight, but whatever. Or I can do what God says. I can do what God says. I could do what God says, Alex. God says, take what I've given you and plant it. And you know what's crazy about God? Is God says, I don't even have to take, you don't even have to take the whole ear. Just give me a little bit of it. Just take a little bit off of that 250 kernels and go ahead and put it in the ground and go ahead and do whatever you want with the other 200 kernels. But I'm going to take that little bit that you sowed and I'm going to take that little bit that you gave back to me. I'm going to take that talent. I'm going to take that marriage. I'm going to take your mind. I'm going to take your money and I'm going to begin to multiply it. And you're not going to have one ear of corn. You're going to have a whole whole entire field and I know some of you don't like this kind of preaching but if you like this kind of preaching I want you to help your preacher right now because God wants to begin to bless you Woo! tell your neighbor you got to invest it you got to take what God has put in your hand and you got to invest it Woo, man this is good who wants this corn no, I'm going to give it to Alex because I used him. See, but Pastor Chris is quick on the draw. But you could buy the corn from him after and you guys could sow it. I like Alex. He's an investor. This is one of the givers of our church. Give the Lord a good prayer. He believes in this stuff. Someone say faith. I've been teaching you this, man. I've been teaching you that faith without works is dead. It's not enough to say you have it. You've got to do something with it. I know some of you are mad at me right now. It's all right. Be mad. <laughs> but I'm your dad. I'm trying to help you this morning. I'm your pops. I'm trying to help you this morning. I'm teaching you like I would teach my own children. So I want to say invest it. Here's the fourth thing we, we learned from this story. Is we've got to use what we have. Or we will lose what we have. Notice that. There was a stinging rebuke for the unprofitable servant in the story. Remember, he, he gave one five, he gave one two, and then he gave one, just one talent. And the Bible says the one that had the five, he, he took the five and he went out and he traded, man. He did business. God's not mad at that. Can I hear an amen? God's not mad at, if you're building a business on kingdom principle. God's not mad at that. If you're building a family on kingdom principle, God's not mad at that. God, you're building a ministry on kingdom principle. God gets happy with that. Can I hear an amen? amen. So he took those five and he started to exchange. And, and when the Lord came back, when his master came back, the Bible says he gave him what? Five more. And that's the word for some of you right now, man. Oh, I, I think you ought to get ready. You ought to get ready. You ought to get ready. You ought to get ready because I believe that five more is coming your way. Oh. I believe it. I was talking to one of our members. In fact, he's here today, and I'm not going to say his name. I don't want to embarrass him. But we were talking about something with his family this last couple of weeks, and he was sharing something with me about his business. He's a business owner, and he, he was raising this church. And he said, Pastor, he goes, I'm, my business is taking off, man. My business is taking off. My business is taking off. And I go, what's happening? He goes, I don't know. I'm, I'm about to. This is what he said, man. This just rocked me. 
is I'm about to make some life-changing money. And I said, tell me about that. <laughs> See, because I, I like to get around the dreamers. I like to get around the people with faith. I, li I, li I like to get around the people that aren't afraid of no work. They're, they're not sitting at home on their blessed assurance looking for a government check. That they're out there working their talent, out there working their ability. And he said, Pastor Al, man, keep me in prayer because I'm about to make some life-changing money. I'm going to pay my house off. And if you know this man's story, he didn't start off as a boss. He started off with one talent. But he worked that talent. And God gave him two talents. And he worked that talent. And God gave him three talents. And he got four talents and five talents. And I got a word for some of you this year. God wants to give you five more. Woo! Come on and shout in this place. He's going to give you five more. Then there was the one with the two, and he gave him two more. But then you had the one. And the Bible says that he buried it. He, he buried it when the master came back. He buried it. I think we should look at the spirit of why he didn't invest. In, and this is the spirit right here. We, we, we look at the spirit of why some people are unwilling to invest. And I'll tell you why is that many times we have the wrong outlook on our master. I think because of our upbringing, some of us have had hard upbringings. Isn't it true? Come on, wave at me if you, I know I did. You know, hard stuff, and some of it was good because they taught us certain things, but, but how many know when you have a hard upbringing, sometimes it leaves a spirit of fear in your life? And I don't think that this man who had the one talent didn't have any faith. I, I think he had a damaged faith. I think that fear conquered his faith. Because the Bible says that when the master came back, you all know the story, watch. He says, why didn't you invest? He said, I knew you to be a hard man. Come on, somebody. I knew you to be a hard man. So I took what you gave me and I buried it. Because I was afraid of being punished. And you know what stops people from investing their life? Investing their belongings? It's not that they don't have any faith, but they're afraid of God. And you, you can hear a pin drop in here, and that's okay. Because it's true. Our view of God is wrong. We think that God is there to punish us for every wrong and to, you know, uh, put sickness on us. That's a lie from the pits of hell. God doesn't want you sick. God wants you healed. People fear God. They fear, they fear the church. They go, that's if I mess up, they're going to throw me in the home. <laughs> now, we may throw you in the home. No, I'm just kidding. We're not going to throw you in the home. It's a joke. We have Victor Heights joke. <laughs> the man didn't sow because he was afraid. And he told the man this. He said, if you had invested what I gave you, knowing that I'm an investor, knowing that I'm a shoot investor, would you not be rewarded? Would you not have been given more? Right. He says, but because of your view on me, I have to take what you have. This is heavy. And the Bible says he took it. And he gave it to the one that he had given five more to. That's heavy. And then he looked at the man. And he says, you wicked and lazy servant. And I think that's such a heavy message for some of us. Because it's not that we're lazy. It's not that you're lazy. You're hardworking. It's not that you're not willing 
It's that you're afraid. And this morning I came to break a spirit of fear off of you once and for all. I came to tell you this morning that you are not the child of your parents. You are the child of the living God of heaven. Come on, somebody. And before they knew you, he said, in your mother's womb, I knew you. And I separated you for a purpose. And I gave you a destiny. And I have a plan for your life. And I want to use your life for my glory and my honor. And I'm looking for somebody that can know that I love them. And I'm a God that can take what you have. And I'm a God that can multiply it. I'm a God that can expand it. I'm a God that could use you in a mighty way. And I wonder if we got anybody out there this morning that you're willing to take the little that the Lord has given you and invest it for the glory of God and say, Lord, I don't know how this works. All I know is that you are able to do exceedingly, abundantly, and above anything I ask or think. Come on and give him praise right now. I'm done preaching. Come on and give him praise right now. Come on and praise. He's looking for somebody that's willing to sacrifice, that's willing to lift him up. Give me some monitor, Steve, please. My life is not my own. Your life is not your own. What are you going to do with what God has given you? I need more. No. What are you doing with what you got? What are you doing with what the Lord has already entrusted you with? Because I don't have much. You got breath in your lungs? Well, have it all together. You got here, didn't you? You got something going for yourself this morning. It may not be all that fancy, but you got something. And God's saying this morning... Child of God, are there any children of the Lord in this place this morning? Come on, help, help your preacher. I've, I've done this twice already. i got to preach all day. Come on, give me some energy. Help me preach a little. Are there any children of the Lord in this place today? Come on, does anyone believe that there's a God that loves them? There's a God that has a plan for them? That, that, then you got to take what you have. And you've got to be willing to plan it. You know you got to take what you have and, and be willing to plan it and plan it with the mentality that God is going to take that little thing. And he's going to begin to multiply it for his glory. He chose the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. As long as you're building on kingdom principle, you're going to experience that expansion. And that's what God wants to do. The fifth point is this, as you stand with me. What we learn here is this. In this final point about faith is that what we have, someone say what I have. We learned this, that what I have will lead to abundance or it will lead to agony. Remember the rich young ruler? I keep saying it. He had a lot. But he wasn't willing to invest it. And what happened? He went away what? Went away sad. He went away missing the call. Some say that calling that was on him fell on Paul the apostle. Paul said, "Everything I have, I count it as rubbish." See, see it? Boom. Willing to give it? Rubbish. I don't need it. Whatever I give God, God will multiply. Give me more. So it'll lead to agony or abundance. And God is looking for people that will trust Him for abundance. You might not be the most talented. You might not have the most ability, but you have got something this morning. And I want to tell you, we're stepping by faith. And we need you. We need you to also step up by faith. And if you could stand with me today. And after we make the altar call, we'll receive the tithes and offering. Pastor Aldo will come out and do it. Don't leave. We'll do that. We'll give you an opportunity. But first, we need to pray. And some of you are going to come to this altar, you're going to be broken because you say, man, pastor, I've been holding back on God. I want to lay it all down for the Lord. So if you're here this morning, you say this message is for you. I want you just to come on.